Hello everyone and welcome to the material science course. Uh, this is the second video of the chapter two. Uh, we mentioned over the previous video that we are going to discuss the structure of the atom, the atomic bonding and the different types of forces. So these are the different learning outcomes that we have discuss some of them like uh, what is the atomic structure or the structure of atom we distinguish between atoms elements compounds mixture also we define the atomic number atomic mass the atomic weight then we discuss the different forces that would be exist at the atomic scale and we said that in general we do have some forces that would be located or a set of forces located inside the boundary or inside the atom while there are some other forces that located outside the atom over the previous, previous video, we have discussed the forces that would be exist inside the atom, which are the electromagnetic force, the gravity, the gravity force, strong and weak forces. And we defined all of these different forms or types of forces that would be exist or that require to form the atom as a, as a single unit. Also, we have discussed the function of all of these different forces. Now, over this video, uh, we are going to discuss the different forces that would be exist outside the atom. And this, ty this type of forces, these types of forces would, would be either intramolecular forces or intermolecular forces. And this is what we are going to discuss over uh, this video. As I mentioned that chapter two will be covered over three videos. This is the second video. So over this second video, we are going to discuss the intramolecular forces. Remember that over the previous video, we discussed the forces that would exist inside the atom. In this video, we are going to discuss the forces that exist, the intramolecular forces, which are known as bonding forces. The next video, we are going to discuss the intermolecular forces. All right, so the other group here, which is the intramolecular forces. Now we are going to discuss the forces outside the boundary of an atom. These forces that located outside the atoms will be, can be grouped into two types, intramolecular forces and intermolecular forces. So again, we do have forces inside, which are four forces, the gravity force, the weak force, strong force, and electromagnetic force that we just discussed. Outside the boundary of the atom, there are some, there are two types of forces, two groups of forces. Intramolecular forces, this is one group, so this is like group one. And there is another group of forces, which is group two, which is the, is known as intermolecular forces. The intramolecular forces are stronger than the intermolecular forces. This is something that you should understand. Another thing that you should understand that the intramolecular forces are bonding forces. What does it mean bonding forces? That the objective or the function of these forces is to collect or to build a molecule or an element. These are the forces that are responsible for combining atoms together, holding atoms together to form an element or a compound. But the intramolecular forces is another force, another type of forces, other forces that also would be exist between atoms or molecules. Make sense? Another thing that you should understand is that if we're going to talk about an element, we mentioned once before that the element is made of atoms and all the atoms are of the same type. Also, we mentioned that a compound, it is made of atoms or made of molecules, but these molecules are made of different atoms. So if we consider one atom and there is another atom of the same type that form an element, assume that this is element. So by definition element, it means that these two atoms are of the same type. So there should be some forces, attraction force, that is generated between them. This force is intramolecular force. But in addition to this intramolecular force, there would be some intermolecular forces between these two atoms as well. This is something that you should understand. But the stronger of them is the intramolecular force. So this intramolecular force would be considered as bonding. And this is the force that is responsible for holding these atoms together to form an element. If there is a third atom, a fourth atom, and more atoms, all of these atoms will be strongly held together, bonded together to form a single element. This is intramolecular force that is responsible for that. 
So that's why we can give a name to the intramolecular force as in as bonding forces. So what is the bonding forces? They are the intramolecular forces. We can even call them as bonding forces. Bonding forces. Make sense? The intramolecular forces is another form of forces that we it is secondary force that the responsibility of this intramolecular forces it is not bonding but it do have an effect but lower or or weaker than the intramolecular forces so all of these different types of forces that this is what we are going to discuss going back to this example here so we said that if we do have an element this element it is consists of multiple atoms so this is one atom this is atom here remember that Inside this atom, there are four forces that we discussed, which are the weak, strong, and electromagnetic force in addition to the gravity force. This is what exists inside the atom. This is These forces are responsible for forming the atom as a unit. And there are some other forces here, but these forces inside the atom, they, they do have z almost zero effect outside the atom. But there is other forces between this atom and this atom that is responsible for bonding them together, which is the intramolecular force or bonding force. This is in case that we have an element. If we do have a compound, so the compound itself, it is it consists of molecules. And usually the molecules are larger in size in comparison to the atom. Why? Because the molecule, it consists of multiple atoms, right? And usually if two different atoms, like this is one atom type, this is another atom type that form a molecule. So this is entirely molecule. I forgot to see here, right? And these are the atoms, right? These are, this is one atom, like this is atom one, and this is another atom. This is like atom two, atom, another atom type to form a molecule. And this is simply is compound. Something that you should understand that I flourish here is that these atoms are bonded together. There should be some bonding force. There should be some bonding that is responsible for holding these atoms together to form one single molecule. And there should be another bonding force between, which is going to be the same as this molecule. So there is force between the atom that form the molecule. Here we are talking about the compound which should be made of different atoms. And in addition to this, there should be some forces, another force between the molecule themselves, which in many cases is going to be intermolecular molecular forces. So again, we do have different levels of forces that would be exist here outside the atom level or outside the atom boundary. We may have some forces between the atoms. These forces, in case that we are talking about element, for the case of element, there are bonding forces plus intermolecular forces that would be generated between these atoms in some special circumstances. And we're going to discuss these intermolecular forces. But generally speaking, there is bonding force, and we are pretty sure of that, plus some of the intermolecular forces between the atoms that form the element. For the case of the compound, it is a little bit complicated, like it is more complex, more forces, but different forms and types. Why? The compound is made of molecules. The molecule itself, if we're going to consider inside, here we are looking inside the molecule. Inside the molecule, there should be some bonding forces between the atoms, plus there could be some intermolecular forces as well between the atoms that form one single molecule. But many of the cases, the effect of the intermolecular forces in comparison to the bonding force or the intramolecular force is very negligible inside the molecule. Inside the molecule. So this is one molecule. There are some bonding forces, intramolecular forces inside the molecule, some other bonding and intermolecular forces inside the molecule. Plus, there is another type of force that exists between one molecule and another molecule that form the compound. These forces between the molecules are usually, in many of the cases, are in only intermolecular forces and they are not bonding forces in many of the cases. 
They are intermolecular forces and they are not intramolecular forces or bonding forces. Make sense? So these are different types of forces. Some of them, for now, we can group them into two groups. Some of them are bonding, are very strong. Their objective is just to hold the atoms or the atoms, usually in many of the cases, atoms as to form either a molecule or form an element. And some of these other forces, which are the second group, are secondary forces weaker than the intramolecular forces known as the intermolecular forces that depend on some special circumstances that these forces would generate. But in general, they are weaker in comparison to the intramolecular forces. Make sense? First, we are going to discuss the intramolecular forces, which we can give a name as bonding force. The objective of these forces is just to bond things together. They are very strong forces. So the, then we are going to discuss the intramolecular forces. The intramolecular forces, it is the force of interaction that holds, its function is to hold or to bond, that bonds an individual molecule together or an individual element together. So the bonding force would exist between the atoms that form an element or it would exist between the atoms that form a molecule. But the question is, does these intramolecular forces or, does, uh, 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 or do the intramolecular forces do exist between molecules? In many of the cases, no. They only exist between the atoms that form one single molecule or the atoms that form one single element. Make sense? The smallest particle, the smallest particle of a compound, as we mentioned here, over this illustration, it is a molecule. So the molecule, which form the compound, molecules are made of two or more elements. In many of the cases, made of different types, either of the same element in case that we are talking about an element or two different elements in case that we are talking about a compound, right? So no matter what, you do have two atoms in general, generally speaking, and these atoms form something, whatever it is, molecule or element. There should be a force required to bond these atoms together like as to form something, to form a particle or to form a molecule or to form a molecule or an element. This type of force it should be bonding force or intramolecular force. There are three main types of intramolecular forces or bonding forces that is responsible for bonding two atoms together, whatever of the same kind or different kinds. These forces are ionic force, covalent force, and metallic force. So these are the three types of intramolecular forces. In many of the cases, the ionic force is the strongest of them all. The, the covalent it is a strong, but in many of the cases weaker than the ionic bond. The metallic is the weakest atomic bond or bonding force or intramolecular force. So the weakest of them all is the metallic. The strongest in many of the cases, as I mentioned, it is the ionic. So now what we're going to do, we're just going to discuss how this type of bonding is generated and between which type of atoms is going to be generated. If you remember over the previous chapter, we classified materials or atoms or elements into two main types, metallic and non-metallic elements. We said that we'd have so many elements that form the periodic table of the elements, right? but we can group them into either metals or non-metals if we are considering these elements from the material science point of view and this is what we need. So now we're gonna consider that we do have two atoms. One, it would be metal, the other one, it would be metal. Of either of the same metal type element or two different metals. But anyway, metal and metal. So what type of bonding that is going to generate between them? How about if we do have metal and non-metal? What type of bonding that is going to generate between them? How about if we do have non-metal and non-metal? What type of bonding that is going to generate between them? So that's why we do have three, because we do have three options, three scenarios here. One option that would have two, uh, two metallic atoms. So there should be some bonding between them, right? And if we do have one atom, metal, the other one is non-metal, there should be another form or another type of bonding that is going to generate between them. 
The other option, the third option is that would have two non-metals. So for now, in case that would have metal and non-metal, this is gonna give us ionic bond. So the ionic bond, and this is something that you should understand, the ionic bond generated between metal atom and non-metal atom. The covalent bond generates between two non-metals. Non-metal and non-metal. Metallic bond generated between two metals. Metal and metal. Make sense? So start with the ionic bond or the ionic force or the ionic bonding force or the same because their, object, their function or objective is just to bond two atoms together. So ionic bonding or ionic force usually occurs or generate between two opposite charged particles, generally speaking. If, if we are talking about any other thing, generally speaking, if you do have a positive charge and negative charge, these two charges would be attracted together through a strong force is known as ionic force. There should be ionic force generated between them. Why? Because the thing with a negative charge and the other thing with the negative charge, it's going to be called an ion. So the ion is something or a particle with a specific charge, whatever it is, positive or negative. We may have a negative ion, we may have a positive ion. This is generally speaking from physics. So again, if you have an atom with a positive charge and another atom of a negative charge, these are two different atom, ions. Or this is one ions and the ion and this is another ion. Make sense? So that's why we got the name ionic force. Ionic force, it, it is a force or bonding that is generated, attraction force that is generated between any two particles of two opposite charges, one positive, one negative. These two particles, if they are atoms or molecules, in case that we are talking about element or molecule, we're gonna say that we do have ionic bonding, but it is not likely to be existing mo between molecules. It is more likely to be exist between atoms. So that's why we may have ionic bonding between two atoms. It is a strong force that would generate between two ions. But it would exist as well between molecules. In case that you'd have a molecule of a positive charge and another molecule of a negative charge, but in that case, it's gonna be a strong force but it is its intention or the objective of this force it is not bonding as the case in case that would have ionic bond between two atoms of two opposite charges. Make sense? So usually the ionic bond occurs between metal and non-metal. Why? It means that one of them, like you do have metal atom and a non-metal atom. It means that one of them it should be positive, the other one it should be negative. How? Usually, generally speaking, if we're gonna think about the atom in the isolation case, like you'd have isolated atom, just one atom, which is not bonded to any other thing. This atom, in many of the cases, it is neutral. It has positive and negative charges are equal. Why? Because it has a positive charge and the source of this positive charge are the protons found inside the nucleus of that atom, right? Plus, it has negative charges, which are the electrons located over the orbit. Usually, the positive and negative charge are the same, are equal. So in general, in the isolation case, this atom is stable, this atom, or it is not exactly stable, but anyway, this atom like kind of neutral in terms of a charge. So if we do have a metal that have positive and negative outside, and non-metal, which has positives and negatives outside, and both are kind of neutral in the isolated case. So usually, if we're gonna talk about atoms, and that's why we are considering at distinguishing atom from non-metal from non-metal. So if we do have a metal, usually all the metallic elements, they do have either one, two, or three electrons are located at their outermost shell. So this is one shell, one orbit, the second orbit, the third orbit, you may have four, so it depends on the metal type. Like in this metal, for example, it has only one electron that is located at the outermost shell. This electron, it's gonna be called as valence electron. It means that this electron, it gives instability to this atom. This atom is unstable because of this electron. While the outer shell, it is not fully filled with the 
with the required number of electrons. So it is unstable because of the unfulfillment of the electrons over their outermost shift. So this electron is known as the valence electron. So metal generally, what, whatever the type of metal, it would have any metallic atom, it would have either one electron or two or three over their outermost shell. But non-metal, they either have above four, either five, six, or seven electrons at their outer shell, like in this metal example, non-metal example atom. Like this one, it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven valence electrons. Seven electrons are located over their, uh, its outer shell, making this non-metal atom unstable as well. So what basically happens here, this atom, that is fine to it to get rid of this electron to be stable. It is easy, it is just one electron, that is fine to remove this electron, get rid of this electron, and I'd like to be stable. This is what this metallic atom do. But it would be difficult for a non-metal to get rid of seven electrons. This requires huge energy to do so. But that is fine to it to attract another electron from another atom to be stable. So this one requires to want to get rid of this electron, but this one want one more electron to be stable. So we can do a chemical interaction between these two, or simply if we brought these together through some chemical interactions, this metal is gonna get rid of this electron, and this electron will be moved to the outer shell of the non-metal, making both stable, and both they gonna form a molecule. So when, so this is one atom, this is another atom, this is a molecule of the two atoms that had been formed by this, moving this electron to the outer shell of the non-metal. So usually it occurs between metal and non-metal. Metals usually have either one, two, or three electrons as valence electrons at their outermost shell, while non-metals either have five, six, or seven electrons at their outer shell. Atoms with, out, <coughs> with outer shells that are only partially filled are unstable. So both are unstable. To become stable, the metal atom gets rid of one or more electrons of its outer shell. Even if there are two, we can get rid of it. Three, we can get rid of it. But more than that, this requires higher energy. Make sense? Like the case of non-metal. So, these electrons are transferred to the outer shell of the non-metal uh, atom. So what's happening here? Where, where is the charges? If this electron removed or moved from this outer shell, this is gonna give this metal to be less negatively charged. It means that it's gonna be more positively charged. Why? Because the positive charge, the number of protons became higher than the number of electrons. This giving positive charge, one extra positive charge over the for the metallic atom. So this makes this metal atom became more positive. Well, because this electron, which already carries a negative charge, it had been added to the outer shell of the nonmetal, this adds more negative charge to the nonmetal. So we, we're gonna end up with two opposite charges here. Because of the difference between the positive and negative charge of these two atoms, there should be a force, of attraction force, which is a very strong force that is, if, that is big enough to bond these atoms together to form a molecule. So this is how the ionic bond or ionic force is generated. Ionic force it is generally speaking between any two opposite charged particles. For the case of metal and non-metal, the metal it has either one, two, three valence electrons. So it is easy for the metal to get rid of these extra valence electrons to, and move them to the non-metal atom. The non-metal will attract these electrons. When the non-metal attract this electron, it became more negative and the metal became more positive. And this opposite charge will generate an ionic force or bonding force, which is strong enough to bond these two atoms together to form a molecule. So the non-metal atoms becomes more negative, a negatively charged ion, so it became like an ion. Ion is something with a charge, a particle with a charge, either positive or negative. So it becomes a negatively the non-metal became negatively charged because it attract negative charge, which are the electron alternatively, or the other side, the metal atom becomes more positively charged ion. 
Because of the opposite charge, the two atoms are attracted to each other, forming a molecule, and this is how the ionic force is generated. A typical example of this is sodium chloride. The sodium chloride, for example, the, uh, the, chloride, uh, the sodium which is metal, chloride which is non-metal, the sodium, it has three valence electrons. So it's easy for this metallic material to get rid of or remove this valence, and these three electrons will be moved to the chloride, which will be, uh, which is a non-metal. This makes the chloride of a negative charge, while the sodium is gonna be of a positive charge to form the salt, which is the NaCl, as already shown in this representation of this ionic force. So this is how the ionic force is generated. So generally speaking, ionic force is generated between metals and non-metals. Make sense? This brings to us something very interesting here that we have discussed over chapter one. If you remember in our classification of materials, we said that materials can be classified depending on their chemical composition into metals and ceramics, polymers and composites, which man-made material, right? So, but the three main natural material types are metal, ceramics, and polymers. If you remember, even we said that metals are made of metallic atoms or metallic elements, like one metal element with another metal element is gonna form a metallic or a metal. But we said that the ceramic material, ceramics are made of metal, element combined with non-metal element. There should be metal and non-metal, or just non-metals, in case that we do have some special types of the ceramic material, they do have non-metals, right? But many of the cases, they are either combining metal with non-metal material. So in case that we do have metal that is combined with non-metal material, what type of force or bonding that you do you expect between the metal atom and non-metal atom is going to be ionic? So many or most, the majority of ceramic material, they do have ionic forces or the type of bonding force between their atoms are ionic. Why? Because ceramics are made of metals and non-metal elements. So we are expecting that definitely there should be ionic forces between their atoms. Make sense? What are the characteristics or the properties of this ionic force? Or in other words, what are the properties that we do expect of a material whose atoms are composed or connected or bonded through ionic bond? So solids with ionic bonds will seize these common characteristics or properties. First of all, they are very hard materials very strong material. Why? Because the ionic force, it is a very strong force. Remember that, as I mentioned here, we do have three types of forces, or ionic bond, uh, for, uh, bonding forces, the ionic covalent metallic. The weakest of them all is metallic. The stronger, the strongest is the ionic, in many of the cases, in comparison to the covalent. But both ionic and covalent are strong forces, relatively strong in comparison to metallic uh, bonding. Make sense? But the strongest one is the ionic. So either the ionic or the covalent, both are strong forces, bonding forces. So that's why any material, any ceramic material that is made of metal and non-metal element, it is a very hard and very strong material. Why? The main reason is that, they, that they, its atom is bonded through ionic bonding, which is a very, uh, very strong or relatively strong bonding, bonding force. Also, they are excellent and good insulators. We said that this is some of the character of, of ceramic material. Why? Ceramic material are good insulator for heat and electricity. What is the main reason? The main reason is that there is no free electrons or ions that will exist inside this material type. So what is the free electrons? If we go back here, we do have one valence electron and this one had been moved to another shell. So this, the other option, for example, the other option, if, how about if we do have one metal next to a stable? So this is a unstable atom. For in, in, Consider this special scenario, this special case. If we do have unstable metal, unstable, it means that the outer shell is not fulfilled with the, uh, with the essential number of electrons or the required number of electrons, 
And on the other side, we have another atom which is stable. Stable, it means that it is satisfied with the number of electrons that it had or it has. Make sense? So how about this extra atom? So this metal is gonna get rid of this atom. So this atom will be flying here. So it's gonna be like free electron. This is what does it mean a free electron? For the case of bonding metal with non-metal through the ionic bond, in many of the cases, there would no any free electrons exist. And these free electrons, usually if they do exist, this gives conductability to the material, make the material more conducted, uh, con uh, more conductive to heat or electricity. But in the case of metal and non-metal, which is the typical example of this is the ceramic material, they are excellent insulator. Why? Because there is no free electrons or ions that have been forming up on the ionic bonding. Ionic bonding, it means that there is no free electrons will be exist. Why? Because all the electrons of the metal will be moved to the outer shell of the, of the non-metal atom. Make sense? In the meanwhile, ionic bonding or solids, with this ionic bonding, they are transparent to light. They can let light to go through them. Like a typical example of a ceramic material is the glass. Glass is transparent to light. Light can go through and we can see through the glass. Why? Because their electrons are not moving from one atom to, the, to, other, to other atom. Why? After we do the bonding, there is no more atoms to be moved, right? Or in other words, there is no free atoms. These free atoms usually they what make the material non-transparent to light, as we are going to discuss as the case of metal. But since we don't have any free electrons for the for uh, through the ionic bond, this makes the material more transparent to light and less likely to interact with the light photons. The light is just set of photons. These photons, when they are transferred and penetrate through the material. There is no free electron, so there is no ability for the electron to interact with the photons. Or in other words, the photons don't interact with any of the free electrons of the material. Why? Because there is no free electrons. And in that case, they can easily penetrate and go through the material and transmit it to the other side of the material. So that's why we said that ceramics are, in general, many of them are transmitted like a typical example, the glass, of, uh, for example. Also, in the meanwhile, solids with ionic bonding are brittle material. What does it mean a brittle material? Brittle material is a material that can be easily fractured more than bended or deformed. Like, to understand the difference between brittle and ductile, these are two opposite uh, words. We do have brittle material. A typical example of this is the glass. If I ask you to bend, you you have a piece of glass and I ask you to bend this piece of glass, is it going to be bended? No, it will be fractured more than being bended. Fractured, it means that this mean glass is a brittle material. But the opposite to it, it is ductile material. Ductile material, it can be easily bended. It is like kind of flexible material, like a rubber. If I give you a rubber material, piece of rubber and ask you to bend it, it's going to bend, no problem, it won't gonna be fractured, right? So it is ductile. So this is just simply to understand the difference between brittle and ductile material. So glass, it is a brittle material. Many of the ceramic material, they are brittle. Why? Because their atoms are bonded through ionic bond and the ionic bond is relatively strong. So in order to give a bend to this bond, since it is very strong, this requires very high force with wood, require breaking the bond, breaking the material itself. So that's why because of the high bonding force, which is ionic, many of the ceramic material are brittle material. Also their melting point, melting point, it means that the temperature at which the material would convert from the solid state to the liquid state the melting temperature. Their melting temperature is relatively high. Why? Because of the high bo ionic bond. To break an ionic bond or to weaken an ionic bond, you require very high energy. If you decided to use heat to convert the material from solid to liquid, this required a very high amount of heat energy to do so. To weaken the ionic bond, to convert the material from being solid to liquid, this required a very high amount of, any, uh, of, he, uh, of heat. It means that the melting temperature of this material it is relatively high. 
So these are the specification. And, I, and remember, this is the main objective of this course, is to understand how these ionic bonding, how these of different forces that would exist inside the material would affect the material properties, or what is the relation? Why ceramic are uh, transparent light? Why are brittle? They are strong, they are good insulator. This is because of the type of bonding that exists between their atoms, it is ionic. What is the ionic? It is the type of bonding that is generated between metal and non-metal atoms. And we, as we defined before, ceramic material, they are mainly made of metal and non-metal elements. Make sense? So this is for the ionic, ionic force. The second type of force, which is also a strong bonding force, is the covalent force, or covalent bonding force, or covalent bonding. The covalent, a covalent bond is formed by sharing. But the ionic, it depends on the difference in the polarity, the difference in the charges or between two different ions. Here, we don't have ions, but instead, we are sharing electrons. So it's formed by sharing electrons or more between two adjacent atoms, between atoms to form a molecule or an, an, an element. When a compound is only contains, con only contains non-metal, this exists between two non-metals but the ionic between metal and non-metal. Between two non-metals, a covalent bond is, is formed by atoms sharing two or more electrons. Like, we mentioned once before that non-metals have four or more electrons at their outer shell, like five, six, or seven, right? So like this example of non-metal, it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven at their outer shell, so it requires one more electron to be stable. So it is unstable in this case. This one is the same metallic, non-metal atom. It has only seven covalent, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, seven uh, valence uh, electrons at, the, at, at its outer shell. It means that it requires one more electron. So this one, it is hard for it to get rid of one of the elect of its electrons. It requires more. It, requ it, need it needs one. And this one also needs one electron. But there is no room. There is no free electron to attract it. So the only option for these two atoms is that everyone is going to share one of its atoms to form a pair of atoms. To, uh, of electrons to form a pair of electrons. So what is the pair of electrons? The pair of electrons, it is two electrons shared, two shared electrons between two non-metals. Like this one is going to share this electron and this one is going to share this an electron. So, and they are gonna share the same electron. So this is known as pair of atom, pair of shared electrons, shared electrons. For example, this one has seven at its outer shell, and it means that it requires only one electron, and this also requires one electron. How about if the outer shell contains only six atoms? So both gonna require two electrons. It means that everyone is going to share two electrons to form a bond, to form a molecule. So the number of bears in that case will be two instead of one. So here we'd have only one bear, one bear, two shared, so the one bear, it consists of two shared electrons. In case that everyone requires two electrons, so we should form two bears of shared electrons. Every bear will be two electrons. You got my point? So anyway, we do have non-metal and non-metal, both they're gonna share the electron. The Every electron, these two bears, these two electrons that form one bear, will spend some time with every one of these atoms. When it is with this atom, it's gonna give a positive charge to this atom and negative charge to this atom. So this is going to generate some instantaneous ionic bond. It's going to generate like, <clears throat> like ionic bond for a while, for a few or, or portion of a second then this bear is going to move to the other atom, giving it positive and negative, change these. So all the time this arrow is going to change positive and negative, positive and negative. So this like gives indirect ionic force that is going to generate by sharing this, these two electrons. So somehow we could consider even that this covalent like kind of ionic force, so that's why it is a strong force 
that depend on sharing these two electrons together. With this many electrons in the outer shell, it would be require more energy to remove the electron than would be gained by new by making new bond. So it will be difficult because electrons at the outer shell contain so many are so many for the nonmetal. So it will be difficult for the atom to get rid of the electron. As I mentioned, this would require higher energy that would be obtained if even if we form a new bond. So it would be easy for the atom to share more than get rid of electrons. Therefore, both the atoms share a pair of electrons. Again, pair of electrons, which is this one, two electrons, the shared ones. Each atom gives one of its outer electrons to the electron pair, so to the electron pair, which then spends some time with each atom. So we'll spend some time with this one. So it will change the polarity, make this one ion uh, positive or negative ion for a while, then it, they're going to swap the role together. Anyway, they're going to form a strong bond, which is the covalent bond. Consequently, both atoms are held together since both atoms have a shared atom uh, 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 share in the electron pair. Most of ceramic materials, both these covalent will have covalent bonds. So the ceramic material, they are either made of non-metals, or made of metal and non-metal compounds, as we define ceramic material. So that's why the type of bonding in many of the ceramic material it is either covalent or ionic bond, which are very ionic forces or ionic uh, bonding forces. Covalent bonds are also form carbon nanotubes and graphene. So for example, the graphene and carbon nanotube that we have discussed over the previous chapter, these are some of the forms of newly developed advanced material. The type, and we said that the graphene sheet or the nanotube, it is made of atoms, carbon atoms. So these carbon atoms are connected through a strong force because the carbons are non-metals. So both are non-metals. It means that the type of bonding between them will be a covalent bond, right? It will be a covalent bond, which is a very strong bond. What are the properties of solids that would be made of covalent bonds, which is going to be very similar to the ionic solids made of ionic bonds? They are brittle because of the covalent bond. It is relatively strong. They are hard or strong because covalent bonds are relatively strong. They are good insulators because there is no free electrons. Their melting temperature is relatively high because of the covalent bonds is relatively strong. This requires more energy to break it down or to weaken this covalent bond. They are transparent to light, very similar to the uh, ionic bonding, solids made of ionic bonding because of their electrons are not moving from one atom to the other, uh, other or in other. There is no free electrons and less likely to interact uh, or the interaction between the electrons and the photons is very negligible or doesn't exist in that case. So that's why they are transparent as well, like the ionic bonding solids. Make sense? So this is for the ionic bond and the covalent bond material. A very good notice here that you should observe, which is this part. Going back to this figure here that I've explained in the beginning, we said that that these three types of bonding forces, they do generate between atoms in many of the cases, right? Like you may have one atom here and another atom, so the bonding between them, if in case that this is metal and this is non-metal, so the type of bonding is gonna be ionic. If they are non-metals, they're gonna be covalent, right? We still didn't discuss the metallic one, but intuitively the metallic is gonna be between two metals, metal atoms. Anyway, but how about the compound? We said that the compound, it consists of molecules. So this is one molecule, this is another molecule. So the atoms that form these molecules, they are strongly bonded together through either ionic, covalent, or even metallic, but the metallic is very weak. So in many of the cases, it's gonna be the bonding between the atoms that form one molecule. In many of the cases, it's gonna be either ionic or covalent. Why? Because these two atoms, they're gonna be either both non-metals, so we're going to end up with covalent bond, or one metal and the other one is non-metal, so we're going to end up with ionic bond that form this molecule. So the type of bonding forces between the atoms that form the molecule, they are very strong forces. Very strong bonding forces that form one single molecule. 
But how about the interaction between one molecule and another molecule? In many of the cases, this interaction, it will not be, this interaction, it will not be a bonding interaction or intramolecular forces like ionic covalent or metallic, but it will be intermolecular forces. And we mentioned once before that the intermolecular forces are weaker than the intramolecular forces. So compounds that made of molecules, known as molecular compounds, the bonding between the atoms that form the molecules are very strong, or the forces between these atoms is very strong in comparison to the forces between the molecules themselves. The molecules are weakly held, but the atoms inside the molecule are strongly held. So there is a difference here, right, in the type of forces inside the molecule or outside the molecule. Going back again to that point here. One of the common specifications of compounds made of covalent bonds, they are, have these properties in common. Properties of molecular materials. So molecular materials, these are the compounds that made of molecules, as I explained. With covalent bonds, it means that, it means that if you do have a compound like this one, so there is a molecule here, there is another molecule, the type of bond here will be covalent. And here will be covalent bond inside the molecule. But outside the molecule here, this is going to be enter molecular molecular force. It is not a bonding force. It is weaker than the covalent bonding force. So bonds between atoms that form the molecule are strong, but bonds between molecules themselves, which is intermolecular forces, are usually weak. Low melting temperature, they are. So this is one of the common specification of molecular material. This is a molecular material like this one. Their, so their melting temperature in general are, uh, uh, is low. Why? Because molecules are weakly held. So this one can be easily changed phase from solid to liquid very quick. Why? Because of these intermolecular forces are weak, is weak. So this force will be, can be easily weakened more by lower temperature. So their melting temperature is low. But if you do have an element, an element, it means that there is no molecules or all of them are made of the same atom type. In case that you have a covalent element, in many of the cases, it's going to be with a high melting temperature. But it will not be counted as molecular material. Molecular material, it means that the material contains molecules and these molecules are weakly held in many of the cases. But the bonding between the atoms that form the molecules are a strong covalent bonds. Despite that, despite there is a covalent bond here, their melting temperature is low. Why? Because the molecules are weakly held. So that's why the melting temperature will be lower, will be low. Also bonding between molecules increases as the number of the shared atoms increases. So the bonding between molecules. But this intermolecular force, it would increase or enhance it as the shared atoms or electrons inside the covalent bond is increased somehow. This also in general gonna give a stronger material or molecular material. But this is something that you should understand here. The thing that we, I'd like to bring to you over this part is that you may have a molecule and the forces inside the molecule would be different than the forces outside the molecule. And there is a difference between the bonding forces or the intra forces, molecular forces, and the intermolecular forces, which the forces also that would exist between the molecule themselves. Make sense? And they are different in terms of the strengths. So this is for the ionic bond and the covalent bond. The last thing that I'm going to discuss here over this video is the metallic bonding or the metallic bonding force. Metallic force is a common characteristic uh, uh, or something that you should understand about metallic element as we discussed, is that they contain either one to three valence electrons. It means that at their outer shell, they're going to have either one or two or three electrons at their outermost shell. This is a common thing of metals. So we have discussed that in case that we have metal and non-metal, we're going to form a ionic bond. In case that we have two non-metals, we're going to form a covalent bond. How about if we have two metals? 
This is going to give us a metallic bond, which is a very weak bonding force in comparison to the covalent or ionic bond. Why? The reason is as explained here. Like atoms, metal atoms like this one and this one and this one, all of these are metals, the same atom form one element. Everyone has like three, one, two, three ele electrons. So the metal, it can easy for it to get rid of these electrons. So when this metal atom gets rid of three electrons and this one gets rid of three electrons and three electrons, each one of these atom, it has no tendency to attract more electrons. They have the tendency to, to get rid of, to remove electrons. So this is going to end up with like a cloud of free electron. So this is free electron. This is another free electron, free electron. So all of these electrons for around all of these atoms, these are known as free electrons. These are the free electron. All of these are free, free, free electrons. So this is going to give like a cloud of free electrons. And this is what gives metal the ability to conduct heat and electricity in comparison to ceramics. So why metals are very good, good conductors or excellent conductors to heat and electri electricity, the main reason are the free electrons. Why? Because metal atoms, they do have either one, two, three, or uh, uh, one or two or three valence electrons. It means that these metal atoms can easy, it, it is easy for it to get rid of these electrons. When metal atom get rid of these electrons, this is gonna form a cloud of free electrons. These free electrons give the metal the ability to transmit because the heat energy or the electrical energy will be transmitted, jump between these free electrons. They, are, they give the material the ability to transmit energy. So this is the specification of the metallic bonding that we are going to discuss. So the bond between the valence electrons and the nucleus is relatively weak in metals. So these electrons that located over the outer shell are weakly held to the nucleus. Therefore, it would be easy for atoms are grouped together forming a material. The outer electrons leave their individual ato atoms to become part of a common electron cloud. So it is electron cloud, cloud of electron, free electron that will be surrounding all of these atoms. It is easy for the metal to get rid of this electron, to be part of this common electron cloud. In this arrangement, the valence electrons have the considerable mobility and able to conduct heat and electricity. They are free, so they can easily move anywhere, right? So they gonna give the material ability to conduct heat and electricity in an easy way. Some of the common properties of metallic bonding, but they are weak because there is no changes in the polarity that would exist in that case, unless you do have this free electron that give conductivity to the material. So that's why the metallic bond is weak in comparison to the covalent or ionic bond. But the materials with metallic bonds which are commonly known as metals. So metals, these are the specification of all metals. We said that metals are made of metallic elements only. There is no non-metals here. So metal atom with a metal atom with a metal atom, this definitely is going to end up with atomic metallic bonding or metallic bond, which is going to give us a free electron as a cloud of electron, free electrons surrounding these different metallic atoms. So oh, that's why all metals, they are excellent or good electrical and thermal conductors. Why? Because of the free electron. This free electron can easily jump and move and transmit energy, whatever it is, heat or electrical energy. So that's why they are good conductors in comparison to the ceramic material that made of ionic or covalent bonds. Also, they are opaque and lustrous. It means that non-transparent, they cannot transmit, uh, transmit light or they, are, they cannot lit light to go through them. So that's why most of the metal, they are opaque materials and shiny. Shiny, it means that lustrous, like shiny thing, like they do have shining. When you uh, try to, uh, to, to insert light waves over the metallic material, it will be seen like shiny material. Why this is specification? Why it is opaque? Why it is shiny or lustrous? It is weak because of their free electrons. All of this because of their free electrons. Because of the free electrons, light photons hit one of these electrons, which will absorb the light that is why metals are weak. 
uh, to the visible light. So when you send light waves to the metallic material, because of the free electrons, the photon, the phonons, or the photons of light will be interacting with the free electron. There are lots of free electrons that are moving everywhere, so the photon of the light will be hitting to the electron. Then the electron will absorb this photon, will take this energy. This photon is kind of energy. So the electron will absorb this energy for a while. So that's why the photon won't gonna be able to transmit or move to the other side of the material. So that's why it is not transparent. But in the case of the ceramic material, there is no free electron, so the photon can be easily go through the material so you can see, like the case of glass as we mentioned. But for metals, all metals, they do have free electrons that do interact with the light photons and absorb these light photons. Will not lead, uh, let these light photons to go through the material. So that's why they are opaque and non-transparent. After a while, once they absorb this energy, they're gonna dismash or they re-emit again this energy in the form, this energy or the, so they uh, initially, they're gonna absorb the photon, the light photon for a while, then they're gonna reflect it back again, re-emit again. So that's why they seem lustrous or shiny. So that's why we see metals are shiny. So these are two different characteristics of metals. They are not transparent, why? Because the photon light is absorbed by the electron, the free electron, so it won't gonna be able to go through the material. Another, reason, another thing, another property is that they are lustrous or shiny. Shiny, why? Because this absorbed photon will be re-emitted again, giving the material the shape or would make the material seem like shiny thing because it like emits back or reflect back the light again. Make sense? Some of the properties also of metal, they are relatively ductile in comparison to the ceramic that are brittle. We say that brittle material like a glass, it is easy, it is difficult to deform this material. It will be likely to be fractured more than deform it. But a ductile material, it means that it can be bended, twisted, and that's it. A typical example of a metal material that is very ductile is the aluminum wire. If you have aluminum wire, or copper wire, you can easily bend it or twist it or whatever, right? It won't gonna be fractured in your hand. So it means that this is a very flexible material, very ductile material to be more accurate. So the question is, why metals are ductile? Why metals are ductile? Is it because of the free electrons? Yes, kind of. Why? Because in the metallic bond, atoms are weakly held. Almost there is no connection between this atom and this atom, like the case of covalent bond, for example. In covalent bond, what is the what makes this atom connected to this one is the shared electrons, the pair of the electron. Here, what in the ionic bond, what makes them connected together is the difference in the charges. So they're gonna be sticking together all the time. So there is no ability to displace one atom from the, with respect to the other one. This is for the case of ionic bond or covalent bond. So that's why they are very brittle material. But it is ductile for the case of metals. Why? Because this atom, there is no specific connection between this atom and this atom. It means that there is no junction or link except some weak forces between them, which are the metallic force. So this means that this atom can be easily slide or glide or move with respect to the other atom. There is no strong connection between them. Even they could switch places in some cases. Like this atom, it would move, switch place with another atom and that's fine. To do so for the case of metallic material. So this is what gave the material the ductability or the ability to be ductile. So they are ductile because, the, because of the delocalized nature of bonding. Delocalized nature of bonding, it means that there is no specific bonding. It means that there is a bonding between this atom, which the same as this atom, at the same as this atom, which is very weak. Even as I mentioned, we can swap places like this one. It would change the space or the place with the other, the next atom. And you still have almost the same bonding. So this is kind of delocalized nature of bonding. And also this delocalized thing comes through the free electrons, which make it possible for the atoms to slide past each other or glide one slide or move with respect to the other one. 
it, uh, when, when the metal is deformed instead of fracturing like the glass or other brittle material. So because of the ability of this atom to glide or to slide, this makes the material more flexible. Like if assume that you do have a set of atoms and you can easily slide one with respect to the other one with no fraction. But for the case of covalent or ionic bond, the atoms are strongly held in place. So in order to slide one atom with respect to the other one, this definitely in many of the cases require breaking the bond. Breaking the bond, it means that you fracture the material. So that's why if you try to glide for the case of ionic or covalent, if you try to slide one atom with respect to the other, in many of the cases, the covalent bond or the ionic bond will be fractured. And that's why if we try to, to deform the material, it's going to fracture, it means that the material is pretty. But if you try to deform the material and it's going to deform with no fracture, it means that the material is ductile and this is the properties, the specifications of the metallic material. Because why? Because the atom can slide or glide to each other, making them more ductile in comparison to the ceramic material or the ionic or the equivalent bonds. Make sense? So this is what we discussed so far. I've discussed that in general. Over this video, I've discussed that we do have some set of forces that located inside the atom. These forces are weak force, strong force, inter, uh, electromagnetic force in addition to the, uh, the gravity force. These are forces that located inside the atom that's required to form the atom at the single atom. But in addition to these forces, there are some other forces that located outside the atom, which would be generated between two non-metals or two, uh, one metal and met uh, a non-metal and two metals. If the force is generated between metal and non-metal, it is ionic bonding force. It is a strong force known as the intramolecular forces, ionic, covalent, metallic. Ionic generated between metal and non-metal, covalent generated between two non-metals, metallic generated between two metal atoms. Make sense? This is what we discuss. Over the next video of the next lecture meeting, we are going to discuss the intermolecular forces, which are the other forces which are weaker than the intramolecular forces that also would be exist in many of the cases between two different molecules. This is what we are going to discuss over the next video. In addition, we are going to discuss the Van der Waals force and how we could calculate these forces for different molecule types. Make sense? So that's it for this video. And for this part, I hope everything is clear to you. And uh, thank you for watching this video uh, and see you in the next meeting. Thank you.